Thank you for the intro. Um, this is my first time at J Prime, but I've been coming to Bulgaria like six or seven years in the row. I usually present at the Bulgarian Oracle Users Group. So this is my first at J Prime. Um, so today's presentation is about the new asynchronous database access API that we are proposing. We don't know what's going to happen to it, but we are proposing. So this is our disclaimer, the Oracle legal disclaimer. So I'm protected by anything I can say in this room. <laughs> you cannot go take me to court. Um, so I'll do a quick intro about why we're doing this, what are the goals of the API, the design choices, and then most of the presentation will be API. So be prepared to see a code on slide. Um, so why are we doing this? Oh, what it is, it is an, an, a database access API. Um, the main thing is the user threads never block. So user thread submits an operation and continues. Uh, operation is handled by the implementation, the driver in the background. Okay. Um, so it supports reactive processing with non-blocking back pressure where appropriate. Uh, this is important. We don't believe that everything uh, from the database should be treated as a reactive streams. We think that we need reactive streams where appropriate, and I will show you those places where we think we need reactive streams. But everything else, we just do some sort of async uh, interaction. Um, so why are we doing that? Well, database uh, access is slow, as everybody knows, so you don't want to block user threat. And we want to bring reactive programming to our DBMS. Uh, it's been developed by the Java community, I mean, leaded by Oracle, essentially. But we don't know when it's going to be available. <laughs> so <laughs> what are the design goals? Uh, user threads never block. You will hear me say that all the time. So we want to minimize the number of threads you use for database access so you can scale at your database access level. Uh, it is an alternate API. It is not a replacement or a complement to JDBC. It's a completely different API. And the target is high throughput applications. Uh, it's built exclusively on the Java SE. There is no third party library in this API. However, we have hooks for reactive streams libraries such as Reactor, Aka Streams, Rx Java to build on top of ADBA. Um, so design choices. Uh, there is no reference to Java SQL, which is JDBC. Um, rigorous use of types. What we mean by that is if you take a, a statement object in JDBC, there is a statement execute in JDBC with a string a parameter. Um, if you take prepared statement, Prepare statement also takes an execute with a string. However, at runtime, it will throw an exception. It will compile, but it will throw an exception. So we try to avoid this kind of uh, not rigorous use of types. Of course, we support the build the pattern and the fluent API. Um, objects are immutable after initialization. One way to do something is enough, unlike JDBC, where you have many ways to do the same thing. Uh, no SQL processing by the driver. You will see what I mean by that is that if you want to deal with the specific of each vendor SQL statement, it adds complexity to the driver. So we say we just pass the SQL statement as is. And the reasoning is if we have this implementation for a specific database, they will only deal with the specific SQL statement for that database. So we don't need to come up with an abstract uh, SQL for everybody. <laughs> That's what we meant. Avoid the callback hell. And I said, talk about that. So you might say, what about existing mechanisms? What about streams? Well, Java streams ultimately are blocking. So that's not an option. What about reactive streams? I mean, there are a lot of things happening in the reactive business. Uh, this is the de facto uh, uh, standard, the reactive manifesto. Um, Java 9 provides a flow API 
but it's, there is no implementation. The user code has to implement the Flow API. It's not much to do, but you still have to implement. Um, there are third-party libraries such as Akash Streams, uh, Reactor, and Rx Java. They go way beyond the Java Flow API. They provide more mechanism, more capabilities. So ultimately, you might want to use those uh, libraries, but they are not standard Java. You know, and they probably they only take care of one specific uh, segment of the Java population. Uh, there is this Jakarta EE, but that's for no SQL databases. This is not for relational databases. Okay, so what about R2DBC? I don't know if you have heard about it. This is something proposed by Pivotal. Uh, it stands for relational, no, no, reactive relational database connectivity. Um, they are proponent of everything reactive. Everything coming from the database has been to, needs to be treated as a reactive stream. And we don't believe that's a good choice. That's a good choice. And the other thing is it is dependent on reactor library. So it only satisfy uh, one segment of the Java developers population. So you cannot use this with ACA streams, for example. Uh, what about Java Fibers, Project Loom? Uh, this, the goal of project, of project Loom or Java Fibers is to reduce the complexity of writing um, efficient concurrent application. In other words, you won't need to use asynchronous or reactive mechanism because you have um, those fibers which are cheap, cheap threads and you can have thousands of them if you want to. So with support for structured concurrency uh, in Java fibers, maybe we don't need this API that I'm going to be talking to you about. The, the problem is Java fibers will not be mainstream before, I don't know, maybe two years from now. It's uh, in the stage where you can only play with uh, the draft API, the API is not frozen, so it's still work in progress. So I cannot tell you when it's gonna be available. I'm not part of this project anyway. Um, okay, so what are the reactive programming mechanism in Java. In Java 8, we have a completion stage and completable future. Um, so it's event-based, it's push model, it allows task composition, supports lambda, expression, fluent programming. You can read more about it at uh, this link over there. So that's Java 8. But it's not complete, and it's not really not complete. And then we have Flow in Java 9. Um, it has these interfaces, but you have to implement those in your Java user code. So I would say it's not complete, but it's a good start and it's a good hook that we can use and build on top of it. Uh, you do have the HTTP2 client Java 11, but this is really not what everybody will use to do uh, Java programming. And this is a picture, a representation of the Flow API, and you can see there are two interfaces. You have the publisher interface and the subscriber interface. And uh, the publisher has one method, which is subscribe, so you need to implement that if you were the publisher. Uh, if you are the subscriber, you need to implement unsubscribe, on next, on error, and on complete. So you have to implement four methods. It's not much, but you still have to implement those. Okay, so this API that we're proposing is based on the Java async mechanism in Java. So it's based on completion stage, completable feature, and Java flow. That's it. No third party library. So now I'm going to walk you through the code and you will see more what this API is through the code. And uh, this is a trivial example where we want to do an insert. So we get a session. You can think about a session as a connection, but it's not really a connection because everything happens in the future. So when you get a session, you are not really attached to the database. You just get a mechanism that will let you connect to the database later in the future. 
anyway, we have a session, we have an item, which is a pojo, and then we, we want to run a row count operation. Okay, so in ADBA, there is no statement, prepare statement, or callable statement. Operations are defined by the type of the return, of data they return. So when you do an insert, update, or delete, you return a count. And when you do a select, you return rows. So select will be row operation, and insert, update, delete, usually referred to as DML, will be row count operation. So here we want to do an insert, so we're going to invoke a row count operation on the session object. We will set the value for the, 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 the item object, which is a POJO, as I said. It has the ID, the name, and the answer, so we need to set the value for those. And you can see we specify the type every time we specify the type of the data. And then you submit. That's it. So you prepare, you say what I want to do, I set the parameter, the values for the bind variables, and I submit the operation, and I, I moved on. The user code moved on, submits operation, and moved on. So everything is an operation. I mean, everything dealing with the database is an operation. So operation are SQL, stat SQL statements, parameters assignment, result handling. You need to specify how you want to process the results. And then you might also want to get some a completion stage, for example, from the result, because you want to do something with the result later on. Um, so user thread creates and submit operation. That's all you do. You create the operation, submit, and move on. The driver or the implementation will asynchronously execute those operations. Okay, more data, more, more code. This is the get data. So it is a convenience method. You don't need to do it yourself. You just have to specify uh, the factory. The, and then we take the builder. We give him the URL, username, password. And then we build a data source. And then from the data source, you can get a session. A session is, as I said, a sort of a connection. And even get session is made Build, build and attach. Attach means we, we put the operation on the execution queue. And you can see the implementation of attach at the bottom of the slide. I'm not going to go into that details. It's going to overwhelm you. So <laughs> I'm going to skip that. Uh, so this is a query. It's a query. And we're going to recoup IDs. Uh, we're going to give an answer. And then we're going to recoup IDs. So we get a data source object. We have, uh, we're going to return a list of integers. Uh, we need to put an, an answer to the integer. So we use a try with resource block, which means the resources will be freed at the end of the block. So we get a session. And then we say we're going to run a row operation, which will return a list of integers. You will see that we are now using type witnesses. And this is important in ADBA to use type witnesses. So we say we're going to run a row operation which will return a list of integer. And the SQL statement to execute is the select ID name enter from tab where answer equal some value. Though we set the value for this bind variable. And the value is set from the parameter correct answer that we received. And then we need to specify how you want to process the results. The way to process results is to collect them. So we have a convenience method called collect, which has a supplier and then an accumulator. And the accumulation here is a function which takes a list. And for each row, it can recoup the ID and stuff the ID into the list. That's how we process the result. And that's how we can return the list of integers from the select statement. So this is what the user thread has to write and submit and return. The user thread does not have to wait for the operation to be executed. So you specify and you, you, you submit. And the close operation. Same thing, close operation never blocks, and it's never skipped. 
Okay, I already mentioned this, SQL support, all SQL vendor specific. We do not plan to deal with the vendor specific SQL, no escape sequence, no parameters markers, and you can see at the bottom of the slide, depending on the database vendor, they have different parameter markers. For example, um, you can see that MySQL or DB2 use column, MySQL use question mark, Oracle use the same thing as DB2, Postgres use the dollar, um, SQL Server use the arrowbars, etc. So if we want to deal with that, we will make the API complex or the implementation of the API complex. So it was a choice to not deal with vendor specific SQL. For example, an implementation of ADBA for Postgres will only deal with Postgres SQL statements. So it's going to deal with the specific parameter markers of Postgres. Same thing for Oracle and everybody else. Okay, so moving on, this is, a, is, a, this is the same select statement we have seen recently. However, here we are returning a completion stage, which is the list of items as a completion stage. So we get the try with resource block, get a session, and then we, in the session, we will execute a row operation with the select statement. We set the value for the bind variables, and we specify how we want to process the result set. So here, we take the collect convenience method, and then we execute the Java util collector to do the mapping. So for each row, we're going to recoup the column, the value at the column ID, the value at column name, and the value at column answer. So we're going to build the POJO from those, um, from those values, and then we're going to stuff those into the list and submit and get a completion stage. So that's what the user code has to write. So the user code will recoup, at the end, it will recoup a completion stage which will have a list of the items. Now I'm going to talk about transaction. How do we deal with transaction in ADBA? So the problem here is, as things are happening in the future, um, you, there is no way you can program in a determinist way and say, okay, I know that I'm going to commit, or I know that I'm going to roll back, because it depends on what happens at execution time. So it is difficult to program in a determinist way. So what we are providing is a flag. We have a transaction object, a flag, a transaction completion object, which is here. This is the flag. And as we process statement, we're going to set values for this flag. It's going to be either set to commit or rollback. And at the end, depending on the value, we know that we will have to commit or we will have to roll back. So that's how we're going to progress. Okay, let me walk you through this code. So we have the try with resource block. We get a session. And here we also have an error processing with the get session. Uh, so we have the, the transaction object. Uh, we get it from the session. Uh, we get a completion stage called ID promise. ID promise is a, an integer, but its value will be set when the, the code executes. Okay, so here we're going to run a select statement. You know, a row operation is a select. A row operation, and you can see the select statement here. Okay, so we're going to perform a row operation. We will set the value for the bind variables. We're going to set the value. We're going to specify how we want to process the result. So we're going to collect, and then so we're going we're gonna to collect the value at the column empno. This is an integer. We stuff it into the list. Then we, we stuff into the list, and we get one value from the list, the first value from the list. Okay. That's how we process the result. That's how we're going to return an integer. And that will be the value set into ID promise, which is a completion state. So we set transaction object to roll back on error. On error, we set it to roll back. 
Okay, we don't know if there will be an error, but we say in case there is an error during the execution, please set this uh, flag to roll back. Submit the operation and get the completion state. So this is the first part of the transaction. The next second part of the transaction is we're gonna do an update. An update is a row count operation. So we set the value of the bind variables for the, the first one and the second one. The second one is ID promise. ID promise is a completion state, which means its value will be set only when the first part of the transaction will execute. So it's going to happen in the future. And then we specify how we want to, we want to uh, process the results. So we're going to do a get count. And if get count is not equal to one, then we say it's a rollback. There is an error. Otherwise, we just return the count. OK. And oh, we also set on error, set rollback only. And we submit the operation. And then we do a catch errors here. So this is where we're going to find out what happens, and then we say commit maybe rollback depending on the value here. So if this has no rollback, it's gonna commit, but if there is a rollback, it's gonna roll back. So that's why the, 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 the operation is called may, commit maybe rollback. Because we don't know what's gonna happen in reality. So okay, that's transaction. Happening in the future, you need to use this transaction object to set the flag, depending on the result. OK, now I'm going to talk to you about how do you do parallel operation? How do you do multiple operation, either sequentially or in parallel? And this is called an operation group. An operation group is, a, as the name specify, a group of operation. It has its own result, a completion stage, its own result handling. It is submitted as a unit. Uh, you can specify the order execution, either sequential or parallel. You can specify um, the whether the execution is conditional or non-conditional. You can specify whether it is dependent. It means if there is an error, do I need to continue processing the remaining members of the group, or do I drop everything? So that's the error handling. So dependent means I drop everything if one of the members fails. Independent means I continue to process even if one member fails. A session is an operation group. And it is sequential, because you're going to submit operation. It is dependent. If one fails, we drop the rest. It is unconditional by default. OK, so that a session is an operation group. Now I'm going to show you an example of how you will do parallel operation, and we will do parallel update. So here we get, uh, it's called update list parallel. We have a list of item. Remember, item is the POJO. And then we have the data source. And we have a query, which is a select. And we also have an update. So we have a query and an update. OK, so we get a try with resource block, get a session, specify that we want an operation group. So we say session operation group, and we specify that it is independent, which means if one fails, we continue to process the other members of the operation. And it is parallel, so they will be executed in parallel. And we submit the group, and then we say for each element of the, of the list, the item here, which is given as parameter for each element. We're going to get a, an integer called ID promise, which is a completion stage. And it will get the result of the row operation, which is the query. So ID promise will carry the result of the operation, the query statement. And then we specify how we want to process the rows. So it is a collection of uh, an array list. Uh, we recoup the value of the column ID, which is an integer, and we stuff into the list, and then we return the list. Submit the operation, get a completion stage, and then apply L get zero, so we get the first element of the list. This is the first part of the parallel update. Okay, so we are doing a row operation here. And next, 
we're going to do the update. So we have the row count operation. We set the values. And one of the values is ID promise, which is a completion stage. We submit. We get a completion stage. If it returns, if it fails, we're going to return exceptionally, and we will print the ID of the element which fails. So this gives you an example, an idea of how you will do parallel operation. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about uh, the, um, the, the support for reactive streams in ADBA. So there are three places where we think we need reactive streams uh, when dealing with the database. And this is one example. I'll have to, I have two other examples I'll show you. Uh, so the row publisher is different from row operation. Row operation is uh, async traditional, but row publisher is a reactive mechanism. So we're going to do some sort of the back pressure control here. OK, so we have a completion stage which got a list of string, and the uh, row subscriber get a data source. We get a SQL statement, which is the select, and we take a completable future, which is the list of string, and it's going to get a new completable future. And then we say, OK, so here we want to implement the subscriber interface. OK, so we take a subscriber of flow, we need a subscription object. The way Flow works is the subscription object is used between the subscriber and the publisher to control the flow. So you need that object. Okay, so we have a list, which is an array list. We have an integer, which is the demand. And we will use the demand as a mechanism to control the flow. So the first method you have to implement in, um, in the Flow interface as a subscriber is unsubscribe. And you can see here that unsubscribe takes the subscription object, and then um, uh, we specify a request. So we, we request 10 uh, rows, and we set the demand, the value of the demand, to 10. It was, one, it was 0, so plus 10, it's going to be 10. So we request 10 rows, and we set the demand to 10. That's unsubscribe. Then we want to implement on next, which is the most important method in the Flow API. So on next, it's gonna um, it's gonna um, the, the add the column. It, oh, it's gonna recoup the the value of the column e name, which is a string, and it's gonna add it to the names. So names is a row a row of a string, and if demand is less than one. We ask for more rows. This is the flow, the f back pressure control, right? So if the demand is less than one, we request 10 more rows, and we set the value of demand to 10. This is a way to control how we are processing, if we are ready to get more or not. So that's on next. Then we also need to implement on error and on complete. Those, those are the four methods you have to implement. Unsubscribe on next, on error, on complete. OK, so with this in place, this is your code. This is what you want to get out of this. So we have a try with resource block. We get a session, and uh, we execute a row publisher operation, which is a query, but with uh, you know, reactive stream support. And it's going to return a list of string, which is a list of names. OK, so we take the subscriber object, we take the result, we submit, we get a completion stage, and that's it. Excuse me, yeah? Yeah? So the question is, what if the list to be returned is one million. Um, so the Oracle, I mean, OK, so it depends on the database. For example, MySQL will send you the entire list uh, rows. But Oracle only sent you 
the number you request. So we're going to fetch a number of rows, and we're going to expose this to the end user. It's going to be incremental. That's what I'm trying to say. Does that answer your question? No? <laughs> Right, the client's collecting the results, and your point is uh, how do we deal with uh, one million rows in memory? I guess we do. We probably have, I'm, I'm not uh, the guy who implements this thing, but we probably have uh, a temporary storage where we're going to stuff things that we cannot carry in memory. If it's more than we can carry in memory, we're going to probably stuff in some temporary storage. But that's implementation dependent. I mean, the end user code does not see that. Correct. Right. Yes, but as I said, if the if we cannot carry the the millions of rows in memory we will have to offload somewhere. But as, I, as again, I am not an uh, implementation guy. I'm just a product manager. So I guess the developer will figure out how to do this implementation to address your requirement. I can report back to, 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 to the implementation. Yeah, thank you. OK, the second place where we uh, think that we need uh, reactive stream support is submission rate, to control the rate of submission. Because if you submit and you overwhelm the implementation and the implementation cannot uh, process when there is a problem. So we think that this is one place where we also need to control the submission rate. Uh, so here we have the record subscriber. We have an operation group. We have the record subscriber where we get a session and we implement the unsubscribe, and we get a session. We say this is a group of operation. It's independent. We specify how we're going to collect the result. We submit the group, and then we have a request hook. Request hook, this is the mechanism that we will use to control the flow of the submissions. Okay? So that's the mechanism in place in the API to allow you to control the submission rate. And uh, OK, we need to implement on next. On next, we have the row count operation, which is an insert. We set the value. We apply. We specify how we want to process, and we submit. And then we have on error and on complete. So this is the second place where we think we need reactive stream support. And the third and the last place is session creation rate. And this is also similar to the previous thing that we want to make sure that when we accept session creation, for example, if we, we accept one million session creation and the implementation cannot sustain that number. So that's not a good idea. So we also want to provide you a hook where you can control the session creation rate. And you can see here the request hook. And this is how you will control the request, the session creation. This is sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, connection pooling, you know, where, where we, we don't want to overwhelm the, the pool because we accept too many uh, session creation or too many connection in the pool. So, this is, the, this is one way of specifying. And then we need to implement on next, on error, on complete. And on next, we get the try with resource block, get a session, and then do an insert into the items, etc. So that's pretty much the API. 
So we've seen operation, operation group, transaction, parallel operation, um, how to do row publishing with back pressure control, how to control the submission rate, how to control the session creation rate. I think that's sort of complete presentation of the API. <laughs> Wrap up. Okay, so we do have a proof of concept because the driver is not available, you know, the, the implementation is still, uh, the, the, the API is still, uh, is still uh, being discussed. It's not frozen. So, but in the meantime, to help people play and fill the API, we provide something we are calling ADBA over JDBC. So it's at the API, so you can code with the API, but you won't get the full asynchronous behavior because we are still using JDBC under the cover. The, the, the JDBC developers are doing a lot of work to make sure that we do support a lot of functionality in AOJ. Uh, it's released under the Apache license. It has been forked. I think somebody from Postgres has forked that. Somebody at Twitter is looking into that. And uh, we're updating AOJ as we speak. And this is where you can get um, uh, more details. And uh, everything is subject to change. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen to the API. And the reason I'm saying that is depending on how soon the fibers will see the light, we might not need this API. So <laughs> I, I'm trying to be honest with you. <laughs> so, so, okay, I think that that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you.